In the Newsroom is a production in partnership with Studio Stillwater. Every week, journalists from the Stillwater News Press invite listeners to join us in the newsroom and hear the story behind the stories. Hello and welcome to In the Newsroom. I'm Bo Simmons, editor of the Stillwater News Press. With me today, producer Chris Peters. Howdy, folks. City editor Michelle Charles. Good afternoon. Reporter Ashlyn Huffman. Hello. It's a senior reporter. You got I was about to say, that title. really hurt me. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Where's my title at? <laughs> senior reporter. Oh, okay. Who knows what's happened since we've been gone? We've been on hiatus for a little bit. Yes. Um, full disclosure, we tried to come back. Uh, we just weren't good enough. <laughs> to our by our standards, we we tried a little bit of a comeback. <sighs> That's the Sometimes terrible thing. Sometimes things weight. just hit the cutting room floor, and it's all of it. Threw it in the trash. <sighs> I think what happened is we won a national award, and Chris freaked out. Every, yeah. And nothing was out. good enough after that. <laughs> no. Suddenly, like oh, gotta... raising the bar on ourselves now. <laughs> but. We've had a busy past like two months. That's true. We have that hardly true. had any mm-hmm. week together where we're all together on a Friday. That is true. And Mr. Chris Peters got a Mrs. Chris Peters. Mm-hmm. So he was out of town for a while, uh, honeymooning. Had to take care of business. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And then just, yeah, vacations, like either mm-hmm. Michelle or Ashlyn gone, yeah. and just not all. And the this this unspoken of... Uh, uh, episode Ashland also was not there, and yes. we, it was boring, it, wasn't yeah. it? Oh, was it? <laughs> it? It lacked a certain energy. It? it did lack a certain was it energy. Terrible and vitality. without me. It was. <laughs> it's okay, guys. I I know it was. I know what I bring to the table. <laughs> it was a little flat. I'm gonna say we were just kind of. It didn't meet our. We do have high standards. Yeah. We actually do have high standards. So, Bo, so. what award did we win? Yeah, let's talk about that. I want. I want to say it's called. Uh, it's just digital storytelling, and it's for our parent, um, CNHI, which is owns several Oklahoma newspapers, like seventeen, um, several, <laughs> fourteen to seventeen, I think, over a hundred across the country. So. So yeah, that puts us in a our own category there. Yeah, Who knows? digital storytelling yeah. of the year for Division two II and three. I mean, the thing is, I, I want to brag a little bit because Chris and I we like we bootstrapped this. I mean, Studio Stillwater was something that you know we just kind of said, okay, let's try it, and we cobbled together equipment, uh, commandeered this room, borrowed a couple of chairs and a table and went and bought a few things and started a podcast uh you know grassroots has been you know kind of a has has had a presence actually in local political campaigns Mm -hmm. and then in the newsroom you know it was like it's a consistent thing it's been a fairly consistent thing and uh it's i think it it's helped the news press connect with people in different ways and Obviously, it's been a good thing for everybody since we won the award. Yep. So I'm really proud of it. I mean, considering what we started with and how we just decided to dive in mm-hmm. I, a year later it's, to have a national award, that's pretty dang cool. Campaigns and whatnot. We're uh, Yeah, we're right here in sort of primary season. <laughs> we are. But we don't have a ton of local primaries, do we? N- not um, a ton. Commissioners, county commissioner races. We've got a county commissioner race. We've got a, a primary reps. for yeah. uh, representative in District 33. Oh, man. We we might have some work to do. Yeah, uh, yeah we do. We talk to folks. Yeah. We do. Yeah, so if you're a political candidate running, uh, you know, we're going to be reaching out soon. Yes, we expect a call. Yeah, in primary time. Uh, what else is going on? We uh, launched a new magazine. Uh, we got uh, another progress edition coming out. What's in the um, the first magazine was? Uh, oh, it's come out a few weeks ago, right? Was it? Yeah. Time is funny. What is time? time you know, early May. Yeah, yeah, there you go. In May. There you go. <laughs> uh, what'd you do for the magazine, Ashlyn? Um. Terrific. You know, Terrific. I wrote about. <laughs> Miss Azee, she's super talented and it was really fun listening to how she does it because everything is very particular. She can't have certain smells or the room has to be a certain temperature or it'll completely destroy the work of art she's making. 
which I thought was interesting because I had no idea. Like you couldn't cook. I think in this there. is her process, right? Maybe no, not no. So much. She said it that affects the glass. It does. She saying. said the glass will pick up the smell. She paints on glass. Did we mention that? Yeah, Just I think that, I did. She she's a glass, glass. painter. Okay. Um, yes. She's actually said that if you cook in an area where it is, it, the glass will absorb it. But once it's oh, like like oils finished, in the air and yeah, stuff like that. But mm. once it's finished, light and smells and all that stuff don't affect it. It's just as she's working on it because. It's like an oil-based type thing. So until it dries and it's mm-hmm. kind of cured and yeah. sealed up. Yeah, yeah. And okay. she made gi- she made a giant piece, and she actually said she had to kind of be over it on like a ladder mm-hmm. and paint that way. And I was like, that is amazing. And she has three kids. I think she said they're all boys. And she said, you know, you know how boys are. They are rowdy. And she's actually had a few pieces destroyed. But luckily, they uh, kept the kids away from these three pieces. So I want to say that I thought that the photo you took of her with the light coming through the glass with the colored light on her, I thought that was really, really cool and artistic. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the close up of the design that she did on the glass was gorgeous. I was very pleased with how it came out in the magazine. So originally I had Miss Azee with her back towards the glass but she was so washed out and you couldn't even really see her I was like all right we're gonna try something different and there was um a reflection of the glass painting on the floor and I was like you know what we're just gonna put you over here and see what happens and I was excited about it to be honest it was a good choice thank you she uh she was very thankful and you know she we had a few hiccups on deadlines and when things were going to go out and she kept up because she really wanted to get the magazine and show people her hard work and you know it was really nice she's a very nice lady well and it's a great way to spotlight culture mm-hmm. too right I yeah mean, to she show said, that there are really different things in yeah our uh, she said a lot of people confuse glass painting with mosaic painting and they're two completely different art concepts and so she said um what we see here in the united states is more of a mosaic piece but and she wants to bring glass painting alive in Stillwater and uh, the United States. And when you say mosaic, you're more, that would be mm-hmm. like what we would consider stained glass, yeah. where you're taking mm-hmm. pieces yes. of the glass. Yes, pieces of glass and putting, and putting it putting together. Them together. Yeah, that are already And colored. she's actually painting on glass. And she can paint on anything a door, a mirror, it wow. doesn't matter. She can but, do it on anything. But it does look like stained glass mm-hmm. a lot. It does. Very similar when it's done. Yes, yeah. it's, it's very beautiful. It's very it's beautiful. Cool. So that's a cool thing. I thought that was a really cool story with really cool images. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed you. that. Anyone else want to volunteer magazine stuff? Oh, so yeah. you just let well, people volunteer. <laughs> I don't yeah. Okay, well, I I did a, a thing on Sarah Coburn, who is a uh, an OSU grad, who is an opera, uh, kind of a star in the opera world. And... The thing that was really interesting to me about it, because I'll be honest, I've not been a huge opera fan. I think a lot of our readers probably are not terribly familiar with opera. You do have this image of what it is. Kind of a lady standing up there in a fancy dress singing really high notes or something, probably in a foreign language. You don't understand what they're singing. It's a whole thing, right? But when you start looking into it, it really is fascinating because it's acting. Mm -hmm. They are actors. Think of it as a form of musical theater where you are running around and you are dancing and you are fighting and you are falling in love and you are a lot of times dying and uh, in sometimes very grisly ways. And there are just some crazy storylines in operas. And you have to do all of that and emote while singing an aria or some type of a piece of music that you had to train your body years and years and years to be able to perform. Hmm. So it really is impressive when you look at it. And Sarah Coburn has an interest, an interesting repertoire. One of the things she really, uh, one of the roles that she seems to play quite a bit is uh, Lu- Lucia de Lammermoor. Mm-hmm. And that is a tragic sort of Shakespearean type story that of love and death and all of those things. And she has this really cool scene where she is covered in blood and goes mad and all the while singing an aria. Pretty dramatic. Pretty dramatic stuff. And it, pretty cool photos, too. Mm-hmm. So it, it was pretty fascinating to me. I, I have a new appreciation for opera now. She just didn't have a lot of time. She busy did not. Yeah. She did not. She was so busy. She came to yeah. OSU and did a residency. And I got to sit in on a Q&A that she did. But it was really hard to connect with her for an actual interview. The, it was also complicated by the fact that she was recovering from COVID. And she had to save the voice that she had for commitments that she had made. 
and to be able to try to rehab her voice and be ready for performances. So it was very difficult to uh, to get to talk to her. That's and, a lot of uh, discipline in itself, just being like, ooh, it I is. need to talk less to save, like, yeah, none of us have to think about that. Couldn't. <laughs> no. I will say I'm a big fan of opera. I do mm-hmm. enjoy it. Do you? I do. I've never watched it live, but every time I've First seen it on like time TV. You've, you've ever talked about it. Huge fan. That's because you guys are weirdos. No, nah, that's fine. It's true. We would have made fun of you. The, well, no, no. <laughs> One time I said I liked Kenny G, and you guys looked at me. That was crazy. that was because of how you said it, though. But <laughs> Kenny G's cool, though. He's a cool. Dude. Okay, Kenny G. He was a whole thing back in the day. But uh, no, I did watch a production of uh, of uh, Madam Butterfly on PBS one time and it made me cry. It did make me cry. So it's a beautiful say, piece. It, with you. it really is. It's beautiful to watch how they just like, cause I could never sing like that. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. Lo- I love the theater. So yes, you were a theater kid. I was. So all of that stuff, the only thing I really don't enjoy watching is like ballet, mm. which, you know, it's just kind of slow. But it's me. part of that. I mean, and she was probably there as part of the, uh, Greenwood School of Music. So Absolutely. We got the McKnight Center with another big announcement with the Philharm- New York Philharmonic. Yeah. For another year of like all kinds of stuff. Which is uh, a big deal. There's a lot going on in that music school right, right now. And how many towns our size in a state like Oklahoma get the New York Philharmonic to come in and do a residency and do workshops with their public yeah. school kids and all that stuff that goes along with it. Mm-hmm. That's so, pretty neat. Yep. And Bo... You did a music story too. Um, well, yeah, a little bit. Um, I did uh, just an interview with Josh Crutchmer, who's a, a New York Times uh, front page editor. But he sort of got his start in journalism here at the Ocali at OSU in sports, which led him into really covering that sort of early 2000s uh, red dirt scene with the. Uh, you know, cross Canadian ragweed and those guys. So it's like sort of the, I don't know what you'd call that. Almost the, is that the silver age for red dirt? I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. how you would, how you would describe it. Anyway, he, he became sort of like this embedded journalist in the red dirt scene. And now mm. he's finally sort of writing a book about all that. It's just called red dirt book. Red okay. Dirt book. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's really good for anyone who's just, if you wanted to know how it sort of all came about and what bands are doing now and the journey different bands took, it's it's pretty solid as almost a, I mean, what would you call it? Not a, not a biography, but. Sort I mean, of like just, a chronicle. Of yeah, the, just, yeah, just chronicling, yeah, yeah, the sort of the the rise of Red Dirt and where it is now. Because a lot of those bands people think about, like I said, that were sort of, and that popularity was kind of peaking right. around here in, you know, the early 2000s, like that when it was Stillwater was just the scene for all this, for this new music. Um, then, yeah, it's, people would recognize a lot of it. Sure. Right and we, we had a couple of uh, bands that, you know, kind of almost made it to the national level. They always seem to kind of not quite break really big, but we had, you know, like the Great Divide that went to Nashville mm-hmm. to try to record and then... Those guys, as I understand it, just kind of went, this isn't the lifestyle we need. We all have wives and kids, and we need to, you know, be home with them. And then uh, you had Cross Canadian Ragweed, which actually, you know, with what their one song, Home, I think got some actual major market radio airplay. I'd actually heard of them. Yeah. I couldn't tell you what song they sung, but I had heard of them. And I didn't know they were had sure. anything to do with Stillwater. Right. And then you've got Mike uh, Hosty. Is it Hosty or Hosty? Uh, Hosty. Uh, well, his yeah. song "Oklahoma Breakdown" has, you know, I mean, that's traveled way beyond Oklahoma, and you you hear different versions of that sometimes. There's actually a documentary about out about him that I got a press oh, release on the other day. <laughs> well, he sends. Uh, he sort of splits his time between uh, Norman and Stillwater, but he plays like it, almost every week, like his entire life, bouncing between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, pretty nuts. Yes. So anyway, yeah. So that that was a, now one of the things I want to talk about is Chris's story on mm-hmm. the building downtown. This is this old building that I had always wondered about, and then all of a sudden, Chris was talking about it. And I think you know, I I like history. I love old buildings, 
we actually got to go explore this old building, which was a little bit scary the first time because we, we weren't super well lit. Borderline creepy on the uh, second floor. Yeah, borderline. And yes. uh, borderline dangerous going up to the third floor with, you know, holes in the floor. Nothing you could fall through, but nails Not and very pieces far. of wood. I mean, if you fell, though, in there, you're going to get a, you're going to need a tetanus shot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it felt a little bit like spelunking to me. Yeah. Yep, but going up. <laughs> Only we're climbing up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was a cool story. I thought it was really interesting. And I'm going to say that uh, I, I got to shoot a couple photos for that story, you know, while we were going through the building that I am so excited about because they came out really cool. They look mm -hmm. almost like some kind of a National Geographic See, I was photo going or to something. compliment you on this. Oh, but thank you. you. you jumped ahead so okay well people you, you do read the magazine it says i took the photos some of those photos i did take i took the one of mm -hmm. Corey, and i think there's two of them that i actually took um but the rest are actually michelle charles so the one that's the full page spread with uh the owner of the building Corey williams um uh was michelle and she was just taking them while we were going through and uh there's also like a really creepy looking one on our instagram page too that she posted a while back. Um, but yeah, my story was about a building and starting with the history of a building, uh, the Lytton building that's located at 907 and 909 South Main Street. And it has two addresses for a, a strange reason. It uh -huh. actually has two, had two owners. The third floor is a... Is the Masonic Hall or was the Masonic Hall. Mm -hmm. um, is it Masonic? See, Masonic? 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 Masonic. I'm going to say Masonic. That's what I'm going to go with. Masonic Lodge? The Masonic Lodge. Well, okay. Not the Lodge, though. So I but know. Like the but Masonic I'm, just, but like I'm talking the about Masons. how we say the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Masons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought you invented something. I did. Okay. If you use it as an adjective, maybe we'll say that or from maybe now it was on. another like, brand. I feel like I've heard it's it related said to that the Masons. Way. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's something, uh, uh, it's just a more super secret level. Yeah, Ooh. <laughs> this might be one that's of the words the, that they don't use in public. The yeah, ritual really level. Do. Yeah, um, that's probably it. No, the third floor because the building was originally intended to, uh, well, originally intended actually to be a single story mm -hmm. um, by Alice Lytton, and then um, her neighbors, the Pierces, and I'm forgetting what the wife's name for the Pierce. Oh, but, that's okay. We don't need yeah. all those details. Yeah, but, <laughs> but she decided she wanted to do a second floor on their building. And they had already somehow laid out things to where they needed the stairwell that's technically on the property side, on the side of this party wall, to go from the Lytton building to be able to get into the second floor of the Pierce building, which is currently still how it is today. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Because that stairwell is actually part of what makes it architecturally unique, right? Correct. Okay. And so then the next aspect was then the Masons are like, well, we really need a hall we'll do the third story. So the third story is technically a separate property from the first two and owned separately too. Um, Interesting. Interesting. So, so what's, there's it a whole going, lot. what's it going to be? What's the future? We, we talked about the history. What's the future? Corey Williams. So the new owner. So he's got this listed on the national historic trust, which means now he can roughly get 25% of his costs, uh, out of a multi-million dollar project covered. And his goal for that is to have a restaurant on the lower floor with um, a, he called it like a leather and mahogany bar. I'm into that. That'd yeah. be cool. Yeah. Like a cocktail lounge, like yep. nice. Yep. Super. Uh, very adult. High end, I guess. And then the second and third floors would be a mix of apartments and Airbnbs style short-term rentals um, because he recognizes the fact that this whole idea of lodging and stuff is all kind of changing. That is still new. And there might be periods in time where uh, having long-term rentals, you know, with six months, one year leases makes sense. But then sometimes he can kind of repurpose that space to be short-term rentals. So it can be flexible. Seems like a smart way to do it. Mm -hmm. And this is all part of the, the move to, start developing downtown south of Ninth Avenue, which is kind of a new thing. And it's something that's needed to happen for a long time. Lots of stuff are happening. And yeah. hopefully... There's a lot of energy now. 
I think uh, he hopes within two years you'll see some uh, major work start as he's still kind of what he calls getting his uh, funding stack together. Um, you know, he'll be, I'm sure, applying for the TIF. Um, and uh, we actually just saw he was at County, of yes. all places, Payne County, to get them to approve this C-PACE. It's some kind of uh, environmental uh, tax credit, right? Yeah, basically, and if we yeah. make our building sustainable and environmentally friendly, yeah, we save on some taxes. Or, or no, 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 not taxes. It was, it was interest rates. Oh, that's right. It that's was, right. It was interest rates. A pretty significant savings. Mark, in- Mark Moore's story said that he would probably qualify for like 5% interest rates instead of 10 to 15%. That's huge. So. I'd say, uh, I'd say our developers around here are getting, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Williams, are getting pretty good at prospecting for some of the different programs that mm-hmm. that you can do. And you can really, I mean, that funding stack that they talk about, some of that's, you know, investment, some of that's your money, some of that's maybe a, a silent investor's money, and some of that's tax credits or incentives. There's a whole stack of different things in that funding stack. Give a development rush, yeah. like a land rush. Oh, definitely. It is yeah. definitely happening right now. It is starting. It's rolling. The sure. train's rolling. I mean, we got to... The school's going to try for a big bond proposal. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Is it ever? Almost $200 million. Oh, yes. It's so big. It's like more than 200? twice. 200? Almost. Yeah, it's, it's more than the twice ones as I've big. Ever heard of. <laughs> it's almost two and a half times as big as the previous largest bond issue. It's a very ambitious thing. 200 but it, million. But it'll be over 10 years. This is the thing. It's like instead of doing two small bond issues, they're wanting to do one ginormous one that they plan for a whole decade. So that would be the difference. The the strategy is interesting. So we felt like with city council, they specifically with their current bond issues to get it passed, wanted to not put too much on and just make it like palatable. And this seems to be the completely different strategy. Right. This is like, let's just do it all and take, the increased property tax hit like all at once like get that line of credit established and then we can do everything we need to do for the next 10 years is sort of the way it looks like the way the um the way the school district is usually done it though their strategy is to keep the bonding capacity maxed out at all times so you always have a bond but at the same time you're issuing you do them in phases and as you're as needed for projects, so that you are issuing new bonds as you're retiring the old ones and paying them off. That way, the level of property tax or the the millage rate, as they say, stays level. This has always been their strategy. Oh, so property owners won't necessarily see an increase; they just won't see a decrease. Exactly. So Got I it. mean, but I need to get the specifics on that yeah. and see like how they're looking at phasing these. And if they're planning on, you know, keeping that same approach, right? But this spreading is it out over ten years. First thing, yeah, this is their very first, yeah, kind of board approval to to get this rolling. Oh yeah, absolutely. But it's a it's a huge thing, and it will uh, change a lot of stuff. I mean, Stillwater High School will look very different when it's done hmm. if it passes. Well, Ashlyn said she's got to go. She's but she's got uh, she's got a couple things right. What was it? Ex- automatic expungement. Yes. Was signed into law. It was signed into law by what the governor. What else was signed into law? Um, John Talley's bill on um, juvenile court costs. That's right. So nice. he explained it. It is a sh- may bill, not a shall bill, which basically means you don't have to reduce the court costs. It's up to each individual judge. But he said that it was frowned upon for judges to reduce it in the first place. And so judges actually spoke to him and said this is something they would get behind. But they wanted something that would say, oh, you can do this. And so now that they have that, you know. but um, You're saying if a, if a judge took it upon themselves to reduce costs of something, mm-hmm. what? People would get mad and like people in the courthouse would I be bet like, I know who hey, would get mad. come on. Mm-hmm. That's our money. <laughs> well, the good news is um, <laughs> it's... I think I know who might get mad. OJ. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're going to actually take the cost up. And um, so they had to talk to the appropriations committee. Um, John Talley did. And the appropriations committee was behind all of it. So um, it looks like 
juveniles will be able to get some of their court fees waived. They will have to pay restitution and victim compensation still. But instead of getting out of um, juvenile detention centers with $10,000 of fines and fees, they could probably pay less you than You know what I'd do if hundreds. I came out of juvie with ten grand in the hole? <laughs> I do crimes. That's what he said. He <laughs> that's the problem. That is exact. He said How that else he, he going to make a lot of money fast. Yeah, right? That's the exact. That is the no. problem. He said he was yeah. going to these detention centers and kids were coming out and having hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, of fines and resorting to crime just to pay them off. And then where do they go? Back into juvie. So it's a revolving cycle. He we said don't, we don't have debtors prisons here but we well, have debtor systems we yes. kind of do but yeah the, let's see uh, effectively we do when you look at everything yeah uh, now one interesting thing to me is whenever we have these may not shall type mm-hmm. things and i mean so now if you have a judge who refuses to lower fines and costs yep. i think the thing needs to be you know you have the ability to do this. You're just choosing not to. Exactly. That's pretty much what it is. Um, and you're, yeah. So, l- do we need to back that up to say that you're talking about specific bill language? So yes. it's a lot of lot of uh, lawyerese, right? Legalese, mm-hmm. right? Where people saying that uh, if a bill says uh, shall, it's an order. May means you have an option. Yeah. That's yep. what you're talking about. So, exactly. Yeah. But both of those bills were signed by Governor Stitt in, um, earlier this month, because we're in May now. In yeah. The, so, so earlier this month. Expungement means that people <laughs> who don't have, if it's not a serious crime, they're mm-hmm. going to start that process To um, get their record sealed and, yeah. you know, the automatic expungement. Unless they, unless they do another crime in between. Yeah, I mean, it, I'll have to go back and read the bill because it's been a while since I've read through it. But um, automatic expungement, it will take it out of the hands of the individual. So basically, you have to file a lawsuit to get your record expunged. And it costs, once again, we're dealing with a lot of court costs, hundreds of dollars. It is a long, tedious process. And now it can be done online and they don't have to go through all the lawyers and all that stuff. It basically means that now... In the past, it was something that people with resources mm-hmm. and a support system could do. How many calls have we gotten? You know, from, you know from who did you say were hired no, no, by, here's, by not, kids not, not, not even that, but yeah, you I was know. gonna say it's like that's you know who calls me is like the parents of adult college students. Yeah, that's and it's like what who got picked up what for like public about? public in talks or something, <laughs> and now they're looking for a job. Yeah, yeah and they you know or but I mean, yeah. and in some part, there was some part of that where I was like. Mm. You know, right now, people hiring, I don't think they're going to care that you got busted with weed when you were 18. Right. But, yeah, should people have a right to be forgotten after 10 years? It's a big discussion. You know, it's, it, that... That should be a large. That should be like a national discussion. Yeah, I think so. I think it's gonna. I think uh, laws like this that are passing are yeah. going to create new discussions and new challenges mm-hmm. for media outlets and yeah. for people who are internet. You know, who are putting information out on the internet. Yeah, because so I mean, I we don't even do big. mug shots anymore at the news press. Like we haven't posted mug shots in what two years? Because it was when I first started my job here that yeah. we stopped doing it right during the pandemic and you know expungement you can't do it if you have a violent offense or a sex offense you can't get an expungement so it's not like you know people predators are out there getting there's another there is another part of this so it's what if you're like you're talking about uh you're going to be talking to people for the primaries and whatever what if someone was about to run for office for something that required a lot of financial responsibility and we found out that 10 years ago they had committed financial crimes and these mm. aren't not big enough that's to, a good question you know, not, I, well sure that, and people think about these things it's like you sure. what if you could essentially bury that from the public or even reporters or you know anyone from digging up you know those kind of things and yeah it, it might be an issue yeah because i was told violent offenses and sexually based offenses but financial that would be just like a regular felony type thing. That wouldn't be a violent offense or a sexual right. offense. So, I mean, I... just depends. It, I, I guess. Know. And, you know, situation. it's not like every person that um, wants it expunged 
gets it expunged. It has to go through OSBI, has to do an investigation, and the DA's office, and like, you know, everybody has to sign off on it and think that's a good idea. So I think if someone, this is my personal opinion, I think if someone had something like a financial problem, crime thing, and they were running for <laughs> office, I mean, I don't yeah. know if it would get expunged we or not. Know. Well, but the the thing is, is we're talking about it being expunged from uh, government entities records right. and right. all that stuff that it is not really... talking about taking it out of the free market of information and it doesn't erase the internet no but there yeah. are but there are certain but. things like in in europe in in europe if you know there are websites where they say hey you got to take this down they take it down like that's the law now they just so, do it yeah. right yeah. but yeah. it wouldn't be expunged from work? police yeah. though police still have access to all those records Law enforcement have the records somewhere. It's just it's closed. just not. Sure. It's, you know. it's not going to be like we can search their name on OSCN and pull up all their stuff. It would be almost like a juvenile record yeah. where law enforcement would have access to it if they were being investigated, perhaps for another crime in the future. Yes, yeah. but we couldn't just we wouldn't be able to just pull it and, and then it. Yeah. request it and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. But. Well, those are that's. Those are interesting bills. Yeah. No. Yeah. And the one that deals with 780 and 781, I've got to call um, Representative Humphreys, but it doesn't look like it's made it through the Senate yet. So it's true. It and might also, be dead this session. And we also don't know how much, you know, since the budget process just happened, um, we don't know how much mm -hmm. they're actually doing because they, they were going to put a, a chunk of money toward mental health. Does that count as 781? I don't know. I'd be interested. Maybe. Right. Maybe I mean... Who's to say if you're? I think I just got an just email from, that they signed yeah. some kind of mental health thing. And to remind people, seven eighty and seventy eighty seven eighty one was. Set so those were both state questions um, from twenty sixteen mm -hmm. that uh, went into effect in twenty seventeen. Twenty uh, seven eighty reduced. Um. Property t crimes yeah, and property, marijuana. Yeah. So property it, it, went up it to removed, a thousand dollars. It removed a lot of felonies. Yeah. yeah. Um, it created a, a lower threat or a higher threshold for felonies. And then the other so one more, had to do more with crimes money saved. Sa to money be saved to be used for, for substance abuse yeah. and mental health treatment, which it's 2022 and we're just now getting something happening about it. Um, so basically, I don't even know how that's supposed to like what work. Is it? Is well, it, I mean, like, they were here's, we saved money, so that means is. we're gonna put the money we didn't <laughs> get into something else. Well, they were supposed right. to capture the savings mm -hmm. and use it for mental health and substance for counties to go treatment. basically Meaning to go it is, budget. It is a to little the yeah. same. It is a little down. kind of theoretical. The money, yeah. is. So and that yeah. was the big problem. Is right. different agencies were all on a different formula and nobody could agree on the same thing yeah, okay so now they've spent the last what three four years figuring out how to get on the same <laughs> you know, formula honestly they and spent the they spent a there. solid two years not thinking about it at all i think i remember when i, I first yeah. started poking true. around in it and it was like nobody had answers yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Yeah. It was like they were playing the blame game. Well, this right. is, you know, the appropriations or OMES. Sometimes it seems to be that is actually our role is to sometimes remind them like, hey, you said you were going to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're, you status? are you are constitutionally required to, yeah. uh, <laughs> to provide <laughs> funds for mental health to counties. I mean, that's sort of the way it worked. Yeah. This month. Yeah. Here's the money. Now give to so now are they probably are all these counties do back payments? It's probably or, would have been nice yeah. to have that money before a pandemic. <laughs> that right. is a, that's a good question, and I mean, yeah. and I think things like this, like the state questions, like this, the medical marijuana, all the things that you know, I th I'm sure there are probably people at the legislature who are like really tired of having to deal with these programs that are being foisted on them, perhaps, you know, almost like other entities say unfunded mandates are not great. They're probably tired of having to deal with things that are foisted on them by the voters after for many years, they did not take action on things because it's not necessarily structured the way they would prefer to have it structured. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's been, this is what's had to happen in order to get things done in some areas in our state it's probably also part of the reason that there's been legislation uh, proposed to make it harder to do a citizen initiative petition. It, <laughs> it, it seems like it's a much easier job to come up with laws to say, no, you can't do something um, than it is to uh, come up with laws to um, try to uh, get people out of systems or improve their life. 
and the, the easiest thing of all is to just, you know, come up with laws that just appeal to a certain group of voters and don't really accomplish anything. Mm-hmm. And we see well, way there too much is of some that of that, too. though. I mean, yeah, but you're talking about the uh, initiative, which I think that uh, did that one fail? I, mean, I can't remember. Which one? The uh, the bill to um, it was going to change the petition process. Uh, you had to get so many from like rural voters that way, you know. Right. And I in I mean, I get it from the standpoint of people saying, "Hey, there's you know, you can easily just go to two major cities and get all the you know things you need." But yeah, it's, it's like just logistics. It's still sure, not right? easy, man. It's like sure. it's no. still not easy to get those signatures. Uh, we've right. seen plenty of petition drives fail. Um, but I mean, say, oh, you're, le- you know, you're leaving out this section of Oklahomans and it's kind of like, man, that's government. Like right. government leaves behind a lot of folks. Yeah. You know, I, I in, think the, those, in the decisions they make. Who I knows? think those worries about the urban rural divide yeah. though, you hear a lot of that because I think a lot of the lawmakers in the rural areas feel like, you know, there's this idea that uh, the the more urbanized areas, the Tulsa Metro, the Oklahoma City Metro, are going to just you know run roughshod over the rest of the state. And I don't know that everyone's interests are all that different. I don't know how much that's happening, but maybe you have some people who feel like they're losing some influence that they traditionally had. I no, don't know. I don't. I mean, you can almost argue that what defeats the vouchers are the strengths of you know rural. That's you know that's rural Oklahoma, and sure. the strength of those voices. That's I mean, because I'm sure a lot of people in Oklahoma City, in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, they would be fine with the way the voucher program works, you know, mm-hmm. like the way it's been pitched. They have access to yeah. private schools. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but when, yeah, when you don't have access, yeah. when you know that your school, you don't have a lot of choices to where you go, and now your school is going to have less money because the, you know, the pool is different. Yeah. Um, and these I, are valid concerns. Yeah, I think they legitimately, I think it was rural Oklahomans who got that shot down. I don't think it was any, I don't think it was any lobbying. Well, I don't think it was any the pan- think it was liberal any leftist or attacks anything. or any well, of that. I mean, no. the, so if you look at it like, okay, we're going to deliver education and we need to give, uh, kids a way to get it done via not basically anything but private schools. Um, one of the, the things that was coming up is that got exposed as not being that great was virtual learning. So Epic schools and all that stuff, they were positioned to right? They, they became the largest school district in the state during the pandemic. Um, and then most people that were suddenly like now having to do this were like, this is terrible. This is (laughs) not good. My kid is not getting an education. What the right so you're gonna now tell folks that live in towns of like a hundred people here's your alternative to your public school here's a laptop and a you know a connection to a cell phone network that's really bad and now your kid's gonna be able to get this private you know possibly religious school that you don't have maybe there in your town Mm -hmm. um but it's no i just don't think they're gonna sign up for that well, there are a lot of issues with it. I mean, there are so many issues with it. And, you know, that's a whole conversation in itself mm-hmm. that, well, it was good to be back today. Yeah. I, I feel good about it. Ashlyn's already had to duck out. We've lost her. We did. We were going to get into an entire uh, thing about uh, AP style or uh, movie tropes. The, yes. the Oklahoma, we, which we can save that for later. So, well, we're going to put this out here give people time to think about it Mm -hmm. okay the oklahoma press association with the upcoming uh convention their theme is uh films right uh news 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 in film yeah newspapers in films the sort of like you know like we said like uh Superman working at the Daily Planet or whatever, you know. <laughs> Newsies. <laughs> was like, well, yeah, sure. those, the other, those kind of things. Yeah. So Movies about journalism. We were going like to right. pitch, yeah, so we were going to pitch uh, either, you know, what's your favorites, what's your what's your most hated tropes, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, give us something to chew on. Yeah. Let the, like let, tropes let just the in audience general for for movies? Yeah. Oh, I I was going to say there are there are specific tropes. I mean, in general, yeah, you could say that. Why do they always do this in movies? But there are definitely specific tropes to journalism. Got it. That um, I in wouldn't want to. Yeah, I wouldn't want to give away right now. But it's yeah. 
So, okay. But when you're in the business, you find it hilarious. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it's like that for people in any business. Oh, yeah. I've sat when through see, so many yeah. movies about firefighters with my husband <laughs> going, what? <laughs> what are you talking <laughs> about? Or you're like, yeah. or like yeah, the nurse's station doesn't look like that. You know, there's, exactly. always, there's always something. Why is he running exactly. into yeah. a smoky, fiery building yeah, right. without his mask on? Exactly. Oh, so you could see his, yeah. his sweat pouring down his exactly. face. Exactly. And the anguish. Save. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Although I, I do say, that I do have to say that I, I do like to think of myself as a Rosalind Russell type, but <laughs> you have to tell me who that is next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll do something that. something more to chew on. Yep. Okay, that'll do it for us. Thank you for joining us in the newsroom. This podcast is made possible with support from the Stillwater News Press. Please consider subscribing to our award-winning newspaper and help support local journalism. Go to stwnewspress.com to sign up. You can find all of our past episodes and show notes at studiostillwater.net. Thanks again for listening. Until next time. I just went and realized I had not actually even looked at the award. Did you not believe it until the plaque came in? Was that the deal? (laughs) I mean, honestly, what I saw first come in was the, the additional paycheck money. We are champions at podcasts.